If you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf betting system Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast 211. This is our 2022 PGA Championship Tips Podcast. Paul Williams and Barry O'Hanrahan join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss this year's second major championship from Southern Hills Country Club, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Good morning, gents. Morning, guys. Morning, guys. Please subscribe to this podcast as you drive the popularity of the show. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org for more info. And of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world famous golf betting system website with our in depth betting previews. My preview is already up. Paul's long shot preview is already up. There'll also be first round leader preview this week at Golf Betting System. We've got tournament form statistics. We've got a really interesting major championship form chart, which I use a lot, plus our PGA Championship predictive model. All of these features, like this podcast, are completely free of charge. There is no paywall. We're available on Twitter. Why don't you follow us? Paul's at Golf Betting. Barry's at A Good Talk Golf. I'm at Bamford Golf. You can join our Golf Betting System Facebook group. The link is available in the description box. Plus... Look out for the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where I present the golf betting show every week. Please subscribe and like the shows. My PGA Championship show was released yesterday, so go and give it a watch. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. To be fair, we could also do with them on on, um, Spotify. So uh, if you're like me, if you're a Spotify subscriber, just make sure you press that five-star button on Spotify. In terms of the Apple Podcast, as ever, for those of you who leave a review, and I did have some more last week, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. Here's one for you. This is called, or entitled, The World's Number One Golf Betting Podcast. Now, honestly, we do not make these up. Five stars. Steve, Paul and Barry deliver fantastic golf betting content for the majors, PGA Tour, DP World Tour and more. Amazing insight, rank statistics and course agronomy breakdown from the lads. Every week, I look forward to hearing picks from second place Steve, price proud Paul, and I don't didn't do much research, but here's a winner, Barry. Thank you, lads. Keep up the great work. And that is from Jamesy, who is in the Republic of Ireland. Thank you, Jamesy. Oh, yeah, I, I think he's nailed the, uh, the three yeah. personas bang on, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know if, sorry, I apologise if Jamesy, it's either Jamesy or Jamsy. I think it's Jamsy actually, but Jamsy's in the Republic of Ireland. Great, great, uh, great review there. It's true, <laughs> isn't it? I always get so second true. place. Paul's price proud. There's, there's, listeners, there's a fantastic example of Paul being price proud in, price proud in this particular podcast. You're going to love it. And there's Barry just tinkering away. Uh, oh yeah, picks out a winner with about <laughs> two minutes research. <laughs> Tuesday morning just comes along so fast. I, I mean, I'm just not in sync with the golfing world, I guess. Or the podcast is recorded too early in the week. I'm not sure. <laughs> right. Let's move forward. Last week, well, let's make this very brief. Uh, I made the mistake of tipping up Will Zalatoris at the at and Byron Nelson. Um. His putting display was one of his woeful best. Just missing three foot, four putts, four foot putts for uh, for birdie with regularity. So that was good. Um, the one player I did get into contention was Mito Mito Pereira, uh, and then he had a nosebleed Saturday afternoon, three putting, three greens for bogey when everyone else was shooting ten under par. Uh, in fact, so. If he hadn't have had that nosebleed, say if he'd have shot, I don't know, even just one under par, he'd have been four under par for for Saturday. He'd have gotten each way place at 66 because he was five under on the foot, closing there. But anyway, that's not to be. Um, 
I, I said off mic, you'd look at that leaderboard. You had JT, you had Spieth, you had Xander, who played golf from the gods once uh, Once he actually put his foot to the floor. Yeah. And you had Hideki, all taking up full each-way places. And I have to say, respect to KH Lee, a lot of respect to KH Lee. I've never read this, I've never heard this, but you get the feeling that that's his practice base, you really do, but that's by the by. And it's interesting now, that Byron Nelson has been won by Kang, KH Lee, KH Lee across the last three years on different golf courses. So clearly, that South Korean contingent that live in Dallas, they make the most of the Byron Nelson. Yeah, But fair play to KH Lee, he played... In the star group Thursday Friday, with which included Spieth, and then on the and then he played in the final round, I believe, with Justin Thomas, and he goes out and wins the tournament. That shows a lot of backbone to me, mm. especially as a defending champion, defending his PGA Tour tournament from last year, so his first ever defence of a title. Yeah, yeah, to go out and shoot what nine under in the final round. Amazing. Yeah, impressive stuff. And yeah, and you alluded to the um, kind of the Texas um, link with the South Korean players last week. And I, I guess it, defending champions are a tough one to call, aren't they? But the heat in terms of kind of media responsibilities and so on last week would have been relatively low for KH Lee, given the star studded field that was around it, I'm sure. So, you know, it's a little bit of a trend, though, Paul, isn't it, recently? You can go back to Berger. Berger did it, didn't he? 2016, 17, I think it was, at Southwind. And then this year, we've already had Sam Burns defend a first title one at Valspar. And now we've got KH Lee done exactly the same thing. Mm. And the thing was, I looked at KH Lee. He actually shot two rounds, the outing before, within the top 10 of that. So he was clearly playing, Pete trying to, you said this, Paul, he was clearly a player trying to peak for that defence. Yep. But, you know, I didn't go anywhere near him, which was, a, in retro, retrospect, was a bad decision. I don't think many did stay, to be honest, from from no. what, I, what I've seen. But, yeah, what was it, 125s in places? Yes. So, that's kind of, given the re- relative strength of the field, you can see why. But, um, yeah, it suits him. Birdie Fest suits him. Um, Sebastian Munoz for first-round leader on his yeah. birdie, birdie Fest as well. He keeps popping up. It's got to be one for the... Uh, Got to be one for the notebook as well. When there's a Did twelve under, he shot on on 60, Thursday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. You know, wow. uh, impressive stuff. Uh, talk us through the Sudan Open quickly. Yeah, so where did you I got go? a place, didn't you, with Becca? Yeah, got a place with Becca. Yeah, Danny Rantonda pulled out before the event, so um, so he, he was a non-runner. But the other four all made the cut. Oliver Becker finished fourth in the end. Yeah, I don't think he was really close enough for me to be disappointed that he didn't uh, push on and win because, you know, it's not as if he'd, he had a two or three shot lead at one point and relinquished it. He was always just off the pace slightly and um, couldn't quite keep up with the likes of the Ryan Fox and uh, Sam Horsfield who won in the end. Uh, Fox was ahead at one point and uh, if you'd have been on him, you'd have been a little disappointed that he didn't convert. Uh, Yannick Paul keeps popping up and I know you've backed him before, um, Barry. So um, one to certainly keep an eye on. He's perhaps his price is going to start getting a little bit more prohibitive. But even up until last week, he was uh, he was available at some decent prices and keeps popping up with some good finishes as well. So um, one to keep an eye on the young German figuring figuring so, yeah. it out. Yeah. Sorry, Bagger. Sorry, just saying. Fi- slowly figuring it out bit by bit. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and. Uh, yeah, you know, if you keep popping up with these um, you know, top five, top ten finishes uh, here and there, you've uh, you know one time the door will open. Is uh, he's not been far away, so yeah, one to watch definitely. Should yes. we talk PGA Championship? Yeah, let's do it. As I always say at the majors, if you're looking for trends, research, insight, check out our latest podcast where we discuss uh, the course in depth, um, winning trends, what we're looking for from players, how we think the course is going to play. Clearly, we'll mention that in this podcast, but there's real depth in the previous podcast 
which is number 210. So check that out. Being the only retentive guy that I am, I'm still in an absolute fluster over the course yardage because that's, you know, I just thought oh, everything has to be perfectly correct. And I'm still seeing, uh, I just, I can't, I couldn't tell you what it is, to be honest. No one's firmed it up. Um, it's on their, on their own website, it's 7,365 yards. And on the scorecard, the one that you also forwarded to me, Barry, it's 7,556. So I think, having kind of seen this stuff happen before, I reckon it plays to the tips at seven and a half thousand, which I have read. That that's the tip of the of the of the golf course. Mm. I think that potentially they've seen this weather forecast and they know they need to shorten the course because these winds look pretty. <laughs> ast- to be playing a seven and a half thousand yard golf course in these winds is tantamount to U.S. Open territory. I don't think the I don't think the PGA of America and Kerry Haig want to try and compete with the USGA in terms of winning scores and the like. They just want the golf course to play the best that it can to give the players as fair and as stern a test as possible. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if they're playing to this shorter yardage and they're going to move tees all over the place anyway. That's that's not the USPGA, is it? They, They they don't want a level par. Winning total. There's, there's no point having a US Open then another US Open in a few weeks' time. It's it's not their not their mo. They want to get it down to ten under, twelve under, that kind of region, which is a typical US PGA winning score in typical conditions. And well, we saw yeah, we saw Phil win at six in very yeah. windy renewal. Yeah, we yeah. saw Colin Morikawa win at thirteen. I think that's their kind of mo ultimately. Mm. Yeah, thirteens. Kepka won at Beth Page, which was an absolute brute. Of a seventy, at eight under par. Yeah, it's in that bracket, I, isn't it? Yeah, uh, he also won at sixteen under at Bell Reeve. So yes, you know, it's use of this off mic, Paul. It's you know, this is basically a beefed up PGA Tour event. Very, very beefed up. Although I will say, this course is nothing like your standard PGA Tour course, especially compared to last week. Um, I think the beauty of this golf course, Southern Hills, is it's long. Although it's long in spots, and Barry pointed this out as well. You actually look at the length of this golf course. It's quite defined where the length is. The length is in the two par fives, which unless they bring the tee up on 13, are both going to be three shotters. The length is in a couple of par fours, which are over five, up to 500 yards. And the length is also in three of the four par threes, which are all around about 250 yards. Mm. You've then got quite a hunk or a husk of the third, the seventh, the ninth, the tenth, the fifteenth and seventeenth. They're all sub 450 par fours, which for a major... Is quite you know you often see you know most of the par fours stretching towards the sort of four four seventy four eighty mark, so there's potentially birdies there. The course is definitely long, but it's long in certain spots. But I don't know. For me, it just it feels to me to be the typical PGA Championship recipe. It's a it's a cla- you know it's a classical parkland golf course, which is difficult. But scorable, and I, but I, I still think ultimately it will come down to people that can actually bomb it a little bit, which tends to be the way. I did also notice, and I need to actually update the preview, Paul, with a couple of things. On the Greenkeepers sheet that came through yesterday, the greens are actually even smaller than I thought they were. They were they're literally 5,000 square feet. Right. And they're saying that the rough is now two and a quarter inches for this week. So if you're, I actually think 2007 PGA is pretty irrelevant because back then it was played in August rather than May. The rough was like a Brillo pad. The heat was extreme. The golf course was claustrophobic and tree-lined. PGA, you know, kind of US Open tough with the rough. This is completely different now. It's open. It's It's wide. It's sparse. It's a lot sparser in terms of its tree line. 
And uh, I, I did read yesterday, Rory McIlroy said the course as of yesterday in Monday practice was gettable if you played the right kind of golf. He said it's a golf course that gives you choices to how to play it. And I think a lot of that means that back, you know, back in 07, even, even Tiger was hitting two irons and three irons off of tees pretty much all the time. Now you've got a choice of three word or you're just going to get the big, the big guy out. And a lot of, a lot of players will just play driver on a lot of these holes because it's, they're 40 yard wide fairways. The trouble with that is if you do miss fairways, you're in a heap of trouble and you could be in a lot of water hazards as well. So there's risk and reward elements to it all, I think. Anything to add, chaps? No, I don't think so. I think, as you say, we, we covered a lot of the detail off in the previous pod. So, um, if, yeah, if you, you want a really kind of more in-depth uh, view, then, mm. then have, a, have a good listen to that because there's some, some, some good pointers in there, I think. I, I do think the green, com- the green complexes and the way that they are defended is likely to be what we remember of this tournament. Mm. Heavily, heavily defended greens, both in terms of deep bunkers and lots of meandering streams, ponds and the like around these greens. And we haven't even spoken about the fact that the greens are quite undulating. Yeah. They're bent grass greens, but they've also been, they've gone back with Gil Hance's renovation. They He literally started the greens from scratch, went back to the old photos, and these greens are, all, they're almost, I would say, they're almost kind of Donald Ross design where the actual green centre is almost the highest point of the green and everything's running away from there. If they're not like that, they're certainly got a, they've certainly got lips on them and there's mm. quite a few false fronts. And those false fronts are punishing. It's very Augusta National, like the ninth, where you know if you can be a yard or two too short with your with your approach, you're running back 20, 30, 40 yards down a very steep hill to the yeah. bottom. There's a lot of that goes on on this golf course. And I mm-hmm. think we're going to get quite a few flags that are going to be so tempting, just perched on a, on the edge of a green that too many of these PJ Tour guys will go for and they'll overcook it or undercook it. And next thing you know, they're... They've got a forty-yard up a steep bank chip to save par to a short-sided pin. I mean, it's yeah, it's going it's going pin. to be fascinating, and if they if they get the balance right, it will be brilliant to watch because a great shot will get rewarded, and a not mm-hmm. so great shot will get punished. Now, it might get unfairly punished if it's a pretty good shot and just misses, but um, if, if with that kind of balance on a golf course should make for some really entertaining viewing a little bit of heartbreak for maybe one or two of your bets or drafting players when you see them come up just like a fraction short and then they're 30 yards down and but um i think it's a, visually and just enjoyment wise to watch it's having those short grass runoffs versus velcro rough around the greens is much more entertaining you see a much bigger variety of short game shots as well and mm. Yeah. You know, the, the short game artists will be able to show their kind of full suite of skills, which is kind of a treat for us as amateurs to be able to watch. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Requires a little bit of um, bit of thought, a little bit of ingenuity around the greens potentially, which, uh, yeah, never. Yeah, you're not watch. just going to see, yeah, default lob wedge, you know. Mm. You think, might see some bump and runs, some hybrids up the slopes. Who knows? Um I'm I'm really I'm really keen to get to Thursday. Yep. A lot of content content out there. A lot of comp courses. I think we you, listeners are going to hear the same ones. I'm, we're not going to shock you here. Augusta National is the most obvious. Interestingly enough, Russ Myers, the course superintendent, worked at Augusta National for five years before coming back. So I think he went. He he worked here during '07 and through that period. He then went to Augusta National for five years, and then he came back to Southern Hills. So, grasses, ways of doing things. I think there's going to be a lot of Augusta, Augusta National feel in this golf course. I'm also reading it, and I can see it just looking at it. I think there's a lot of core, especially the green complexes, the way that the green complexes could repel shots and run off areas and whatever. I see there's a definite link to Shinnecock potentially. 
Just to firm up that Shinnecock top 10 from the US Open they played there in 19, Kepka, Fleetwood, DJ, Paul's friend Patrick Reed, Tony T2 Finau, naturally, Daniel Berger, Hatton, Xander, Simpson. That was your top 10. I also think there's potentially a link to... Um, I mean, I just went on... To, I, I went back in my records. Long part 70s of a rarity. They're a rarity on the PGA Tour. They're a real rarity. There's two, there's there's one that's very obvious. That's East Lake, where they play the Tour Championship every year. That's a stretching par seventy that is very very classical. So I don't think a, I don't think an East Lake leaderboard is a bad thing to look at. Um, how you deal with the latest leaderboards with this ridiculous Tour Championship scoring system? I don't know. I've just taken seventy two hole scores. Um, one player that is all over. Eastlake is Xander. It is just, whatever leaderboard you look at, Xander's yeah. pretty much at the top of it around Eastlake. The other one that's a little bit off grid, but you boys will know it because um, I had the winner there last year, was Jason Cochrag. It's Memorial Park that they play in Houston now. That's another, that's a plus 7,400 yard par 70. And windswept, tree-lined, plenty of water in play there. Apart from the fact that it's got Bermuda grass greens, I think that's a good co- That's a good comp, I really do. There's also Colonial Country Club, and the Colonial Country Club link is very much the fact that this is a Perry Maxwell original design. Both of them are, Colonial and here. And I did hear Jordan Spieth in a interview he did last week at the Byron Nelson, saying he felt really good about his chances here this week. He really loved the greens. The greens and the run-up to the greens, he said, were virtually the same as what you get at Colonial Country Club. Those were his words, not mine. But we can't... Just through the research that we've all done, we kind of got to Colonial being a good comp course anyway. So the, the, for me, they're comp courses I think you need to be looking at mm-hmm. in terms of leaderboards. It's a very open betting affair. It really is. Uh, it's good in terms of what's available out there. Um, Boyle Sports are the only um, firm that are a stat. Uh, they're 11 places each way, 50 odds this week. They're standard each way terms. That's standout. We've got other firms doing 10, but only Boyle Sports are at 11 and a fifth the place. So fair play to Boyle Sports. Um, if you are looking to open a Boyle Sports account, and we have been mentioning them now for years because they are number one for extended each way places week in, week out. You can access a bet £10 Get £20 free bet for new customers, 18 plus, at Golf Betting System. That is a deal for those of you in England, Scotland and Wales. You need to be signing up also by a mobile device or tablet. There is also, though, another bookmaker that we want to bring to the party. And Paul is living proof of these guys because he's backed one of his long shots with them. (laughs) <laughs> so they've, they're already taking <laughs> Paul's money. We're going to mention 10-bet for the PGA Championship. Now, 10-bet, we've noted them for a while. They offer standout prices on popular players week in, week out, with market-leading odds, which you take on the basis that they play five places each way at quarter-odd terms. So standard industry terms, but market-leading odds. So as we record this podcast right now, Tuesday, early Tuesday morning over here in the UK, they are offering market best right now. McElroy at 16 to 1. Cam Smith at 25 to 1, which I must say is a bloody good price on Cam Smith, who I think is a real danger. They've got Wacky Neiman and Matt Fitzpatrick at 45 to 1. And they've got... One of Barry's favourites, Max Homer at 80 to 1. 
Those prices cannot be matched elsewhere right now. New Tenbet customers get a 50% welcome bonus up to £50 when signing up through Golf Betting System. You can find details about their new customer promotion plus a link through to that very offer with T's and C's in this podcast description. T- Ten bet. I think they're going to be a bookmaker that we mention in, in more uh, podcasts moving forward. Now, I know that you, Paul, this, I mean, it's just the, the right link through. I know that you have backed a player with Ten bet for this year's PGA. Who is it? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because um, when I put, I put three longer shots up yesterday, it's three um, three triple digit players, and the longest of the three um, was Ricky Fowler, who I put up at. Uh, I backed him at three hundred to one with uh, with ten bet um, with five places, and I I don't know. You, you look at all the different options, and Boyle Sports they've got him at one hundred and twenty five to one with eleven places. Now, if you're looking for an each way place, um, want to take the full maximum places, then you know one hundred and twenty five to one's the price. If I'm taking a chance on a player and <laughs> taking a big chance, and when I put the preview up, someone tweeted to me, "Seek help." When <laughs> when I tweeted um, the, uh, the the Ricky Fowler uh, tip, um, which is probably right, really. Um, but yeah, if I'm taking a chance on a player like Fowler, um, I'm going to take a big price. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take take the price, take the three hundreds, take take my chances with five places, and just see what happens. But, what did Jamsy call you? Price proud Paul. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> taking three hundred to one on Ricky Fowler. Yeah, I mean, ten I, places uh, with I, ten bet. Again, yeah, you know, he's been he's been um, chopped in a little bit now. So um, if uh, you know, perhaps there's some equally mad people out there, but I don't know if you if you're looking at the different the relative prices, then I, the jump from one twenty five to three hundred was too much for me. I've I've just got to take the price. But let, do you know let, what I reckon? Do you know what I was going to reckon? I know yeah. what will happen here, Barry. <laughs> I can see Ricky Fowler T five with about four other players. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it'll all get chopped to sin. To the and effect if he'd have of one twenty-five, twenty-five yeah. to one with balls, <laughs> yeah. he'd have got a full each way return. Oh, don't I know, but he's losing the way. I get it. I get it, Paul. I mean, and let's give him a bit of support um, or li- a little bit of logic and rationale to his Ricky bet. Like Rick, Ricky placed last year in the PGA out of nowhere, mm-hmm. and the last few weeks, even though the results are a bit sloppy or the final finishing positions are a bit sloppy. There's bits and pieces there that are slowly coming together. So he just, he still has the catastrophes in there, um, which is not good for your overall finishing position. But he just seems to be adding a piece to the puzzle every time. Um, I know this is said with rose tinted glasses because I'm a big Ricky fan, but I can see why you jumped on it. Yeah. No, no, I agree, but eighth at Kiwa, as you say, that I think that was his first top ten for it was well over a year, it might have been about fifteen, sixteen months, something like that. And uh, I don't know, you go back in, you don't have to go back too many years. And Ricky Fowler was always a short price for all the majors. I mean, this is a guy who's finished top three in all four majors. In fact, he's finished as a runner-up in three of the four majors over his career. Um, and still only 33. I think there's time for a comeback from Ricky Fowler, yeah? He's become a mm-hmm. father. He got married since his last win, which was... Again, it was only 2019. It wasn't a million miles back, was it? And if you're talking about a long classical track, wind of feature, bent grass greens, I, that ticks everything for me with Ricky, oh, Ricky Fowler. I used to bang him up at Augusta National every year. So it yeah. just shows you he's right. I, I, yeah. there, there's, I've got some metrics here that I looked at. Driving distance, all drives. Approaches from plus 200. Approaches from 100 to 125, because I think that's going to be a key number. I think short approaches with wedge on a lot of these holes is going to be the shot that we're going to see a plenty of. Mm. The way I've worked it out, it could be up five, six, maybe even seven holes, short wedges. Yep. Each round, going for the green. He ticks every single box statistically this season, even though he's been playing poorly. He just cannot piece it all together. But the met, the, you know, the elements of his game is still elite. He's just actually pulling it together across a round, or certainly across seventy-two holes. Yeah, but yeah, as Barry said, from nowhere last year, got a, got a top ten finish at Kira Island. 
Yeah, and perhaps this is the week. And, it, it, that and you've got the, the Oklahoma one. links with the university and blah, blah, blah. blah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he was third at the CJ Cup in the autumn as well. Um, 21st last time out at Potomac, wasn't he? So um, a couple of decent mm. rounds there. 66 he opened with, 68 he closed with. I think he just deserves a little bit more respect in the betting. And um, if it turns out to be a value loser, then so be it. But um, I'll take the chance at that price, I think. <laughs> if you're a listener tuning in to expect to talk about the like the top guy, Guys and the guys who are playing elite level golf right now. When we give you six or seven <laughs> minutes, great, on Ricky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is why people. This is why people either love our podcast or hate yeah. our podcast because seven out of ten other podcasts will be talking about their predictive models, and they'll be given a list of obvious players like John Rahm, Xander Schauffele, and we start off with Ricky Fowler at three hundred to one with ten. <laughs> yeah, seek help. <laughs> I'm going to actually back that up. Go on. I'm backing that. We're going to work in reverse. We're going to Ooh, work like in that. reverse this week. We're going to go with the big numbers, the bit, the names that people have got no interest in whatsoever. <laughs> now, I'm seeing a weather forecast in front of me. In fact, I'm just going to press the refresh button. Let's make sure this is as close to reality as we can. We've mentioned in the research podcast, high winds. I mean, it's Oklahoma. It's Tulsa, baby. 24 hours to Tulsa. It's windy. That's just the way that Oklahoma is. So... I'm seeing southwesterlies to southerlies on Thursday. They seem to have come down slightly, which is good. They've, it's still strong, but it doesn't look like they're going to haul them off the course strong. So up to 25 miles an hour on Thursday, southerly. The wind direction stays similar for Friday. Friday morning looks hellish. <laughs> I'm seeing numbers gusting up to 40 plus. Mm. That does concern me that there's going to be a real advantage for late starters on Friday. So make a note of that, chaps and ladies. If you're looking at stacking on your DraftKings teams, late Friday starters may get a big break looking at this latest weather forecast, although it's only Tuesday. I must say Windfinder does tend to be bloody accurate. Saturday looks calmer. The wind changes to the north. There's a huge front running through. So all of a sudden, 30 degree humidity disappears and we're down to 18 to 20 degrees Celsius on Saturday. The wind swaps 180 to the north. But again, it looks in the afternoon for the leaders, I would suggest it's going to be gusting up to 25 miles an hour, which is plenty. This isn't TPC Craig Ranch this week. This is a proper major track. 25 mile an hour winds are going to be hard around here. Sunday, again, slightly down. Very cold. Well, not very cold. 19 degrees Celsius. But it's not kind of the heat that we were getting in the first two days. Again, northerly, gusting around about 15 miles an hour. I reckon any... This is my gut feel. And I'm sitting in my uh, office in Hertfordshire in the United Kingdom. I'm not in Tulsa. I wouldn't be surprised if something around the six to seven under mark is leading going into Sunday. And then the course eases up and players get a bit of a charge on. I reckon 11, potentially 12 under par wins it. Yep. Yeah, which would be in keeping with the uh, the ethos of the event. Okay. So, this was my tip in the 300 to 1 range. Now, we've said these kind of events, you always get a Jordan Spieth. In the old days, when he didn't play with PXG, Patrick Reed. And even Matt Fitzpatrick, players with those kind of short magic bean type kind of games that pop out at these tough technical assignments where there's a you know, this golf course will produce a lack of predictability with approach shots. And when the ball hits the ground, there's so, so much undulation, there's uneven lies on the fairways. This is a golf course where predictable outcomes are going to be far lower than you get at somewhere last like last week at Craig Ranch. And that's where players of this ilk come to the fore. When you've got to grind out pars and where scoring's high. 
So Spieth, Fitzpatrick. I can see why Fitzpatrick's going to be popular this week because that forecast is Matt Fitzpatrick for me. Although I think ultimately the course is a bit too long for him to win it. I've gone for Mackenzie Hughes, who I thought 300 to 1 with Paddy Power was a bit disrespectful. I mean, he's in the top 70 in the world. And they're banging him up at 300 to 1 as if he's a no-hoper. You look at Hughes. He actually made the frame last year at Sandwich. Yeah, another golf course where the predictability of the bounce is completely... <laughs> you know, it's difficult round sandwich. He came sixth there last year in the Open. He was 15th at Torrey Pines in the US Open. 50th this year at Augusta National. Now, Augusta National, at like a rea- really reality 7,800, 7,900 yards is not Mackenzie Hughes in any way, shape or form. The only reason why he made the cut there and why he was half competitive around Augusta National was because... The wind was blowing for the first 54 holes. And that's the point. Windy conditions, tough, tough golf courses. In the main, past 70s, you find Hughes just levitating, gravitating towards the top of leaderboards. So I'm going with Hughes this week. He was in the top 10 at the Wells Fargo. There's another prime example. That was horrible at the Wells Fargo where we got Homer as the winner. Raining. High winds, it was gusting over 40 miles an hour on Saturday. Guess what? Mackenzie Hughes, top 10. So, yeah, I've taken Hughes at that 300 to 1 price point with Paddy Power. I managed to get 10 places each way of 50 odds with Mackenzie Hughes. I'm just looking right now. I think he's a 2. 250 to 1 is generally available across these bookmakers offering 10 places each way. Mackenzie Hughes. Uh, Barry, who have you got at big numbers? You must have a few triple digits. That's that's your way of life. I, yeah, I, fu- I haven't fully developed the plan yet. Surprise, surprise. You're but, just thinking about it right now. I'm well. It's been no. It's been percolating in the head. <clears throat> but Poseidon how it popped into my head there uh, over the weekend, and mm. um, now that we're on the subject of long shots, I'm trying to back it up. <laughs> why, why is in my head? Um, but one thing I started looking at for this week was um, proximity and approaches. And he is, I, I think that's going to help, you know, just the, the closer you can, if you could shoot at the middle of the green all week, you're, you know, that's a pretty good start. And if you can fine tune that to the sections of the green, then you're starting to get like pretty handy. So he's mm-hmm. T15 in proximity um, and approach. And. Mm-hmm. You know, that's starting to kind of make things uh, a little bit interesting for me. And, uh, you know, add to that, he is, I'm looking this up on the fly here. So uh, he's fifth in sand save percentage. Another one of the metrics we were looking at um, last week when we were kind of trying to figure out what you'd need uh, going into this week to be a skill set that would work for you. Um, So he's, then he is seventh in scrambling. So, oh, yeah. Good on approach and good at scrambling. And he's 125 to 1. Where are we there? Generally, yeah. Quite a yeah, lot of him is there with Paddy and Betfair right now. Yeah, 10 places. Yeah, 10. So uh, I think I've talked myself into it. Paul, Paul's always said to me, classical, well, he's South African. Classical course, tree line, bent grass green. Bit of wind. Yeah, not too, Paul's also, I think he said to me, he doesn't like long courses as such, does he, Paul? He, he likes the shorter ones, yeah, like a, I, like yeah. a Wentworth. The, the best of his um, results have come on, uh, yeah, kind of 7,000 to 7,200 yard courses. But that's not to say that he won't be able to do it. I, I think the logic's right, Barry, because um, as Steve just said, classical tracks, um, bent grass greens. Uh, you look at his Valderrama win. Um, when he won that um, won that event, what, back in 2019 it'll have been now, he... Um, he was outstanding around the greens. He's putting, I, I, I'm sure, just using old metrics, and I've, got, I've not got them in front of me. I'm sure he putted as something like sub 1.5 putts per greens and regulation back in old money. Um, wow. His greens and regulation, you know, I think he hit less than half of the greens, which, um, you know, you, you don't want to be doing with any regularity, but still managed to win that golf tournament because his short game was so on point that week. 
And when you look at a forecast like the one we've got, when you look at a, a, a tough track that's going to, um, you know, players are going to, a lot of players are going to miss greens over the course of the uh, four days. Yeah. Then that ability to find a way to get yourself up and down is going to be pretty, pretty important. So, yeah, given that you had a decent showing last week, I can't, uh, I, I, can't I can't and wouldn't put you off that bet, Barry. I don't think. He get this. He won around Valderrama. To back up your point, Paul, fuck, this is crazy. He hit 47.2% of greens. Yeah, that's right. He scrambled at 74% second in the field and putted at 1.43 putts per GIR. <laughs> Amazingly enough, that topped that particular category. Yeah. So he was absolute magic beans around the greens, which is what we're saying. Bezayden, who, Mackenzie Hughes. People that can just get up and down, good bunker play, fantastic scramblers, and a hot putter on Ben Grass. Mm. Where do you reckon? Where do you reckon greens and regulation tops out this week? I don't think there'll be many positive of seventy percent GIR. No. no, I think you might get one or two. I think your average will probably be about 62, 63, something like that. Which means you're, could, you're scrambling. Be lower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you're I'd be under sixty. That wind, yep, yep, yep. I would be surprised if you're going to be seeing something like mid fifties average GIR. Yeah, potentially. It's going to be one of those majors where you go through the numbers on a Monday and you're seeing a whole host of players sub fifty percent greens in reg. You don't see that very often. That's what I'm saying. This is not a PGA Tour golf course. This is a this is a proper major championship test. Never forget that, listeners. And that's the kind of play you need to pick. Um, it's not always what a predictive model will generate for you. I think scrambling and and sand saves, we mentioned that in the research podcast, absolutely vital this week. Mm. And there are quite a few of the elite guys that have relatively weak around the green games. I won't mention names, just go and have a look. Look at their numbers. Victor Hovland <laughs> being the prime <laughs> example. Right, I've got three players south of thirty to one, so I can't really go next. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand this section of the show over to you boys, so run it. Yep, okay, I've got another two in that in the kind of hundred to one bracket. Jason Kokrak, who we've mentioned a couple of times, I picked him up yesterday at 110 to 1, um, with eight places each way. There's still similar prices in terms of available right now. Um I backed him as one of the long shots at the Masters back at um, Augusta last month. He was ninth going into Sunday, finished 14th overall, so close but no cigar in terms of each way. That's a big step for him at majors, though, 14th. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was that his best ever major finish? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I think it was. He's had some kind of middling performances in the past, but um, he's he's slowly getting better, isn't he? He's slowly getting closer Mm. in these bigger events, and I I think it's only a matter of time before he... Um, moves forward and uh, you know, top tens and potentially better. His game is very much suited to a tougher test, in my view. Uh, yeah, that was tied, his, that was his best major finish. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, tied for thirty fifth um, after that at the Heritage seventeenth uh, last week, and that was on a birdie fest. And that's uh, again, the birdie fest just absolutely don't suit him. It was a really good sign, I think, that his game's pretty in pretty good shape altogether. And if you boil it down, three wins in his last 40 starts altogether, that's that's a really good conversion rate. There's not many out there in the game right now who've got a better conversion rate, you know, bar Scotty Scheffler than Jason Kokrak from the last 40 starts or so. He's long enough off the tee, good short game. Um, uh, Colonial you mentioned earlier, Steve, um, he's defending there next week. He finished third the week uh, the year before, then, then won last year. Some good correlation with that track. Um, you mentioned another that uh, Coke rack uh, slips my mind now. That one, um, at one oh, last, last year, year he won the M- Memorial Park. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We- we're on at fifty to one. That's another Texas. So two of his three wins are in Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. Now just to, just to work through the just work through the geography here, Paul. People are going, oh, Texas. Oklahoma is directly north. Uh, sorry, Tulsa is two hundred and fifty to two hundred and seventy miles north of Dallas in Texas. It's a neighbouring state of Texas. And when you look at Texas and Texas golf, everyone tell you Texas golf is all about windswept, pretty classical golf courses, long in the main. 
So actually, players that can play well in Texas, I think that's going to directly correlate with what we see in Oklahoma this week because effectively they're next door to each other. Yeah. Yeah, it seems quite comfortable in the region, doesn't he? So um, He does. So yeah, I think it's a good bet at 110 or thereabouts. Again, you can take um, a slightly shorter price with more places, but um, each to their own. Um, I've also backed Gary Woodland at 125 to 1. Again, eight places each way. And... Again, on a stretching course, players who can combine that um, a bit of length with a bit of accuracy should uh, should give themselves a, the best chance here this week. Chances of keeping out of trouble, I guess, for the most part. But also, if you're attacking these small greens from the the right parts of fairways, it gives you the best chance of finding the the, the correct and small parts of the greens that are going to allow you to uh, to, to score um, when you do get to the uh, putting surfaces. Averages 310 off the tee. That's good enough for me. That's top 20 in distance for the season to date. Uh, in the wind, those low stingers that he can uh, he can churn out as well, they're ideal for playing in the wind. And his irons have been good. Second for greens and regulation at Mexico. Ninth for greens and regulation at the Texas Open as well. Top 40 for scrambling or thereabouts for the season. I, I, you know, you add it all together and Gary Woodland feels a really good mix or a really good fit rather for, for this uh, for this week. I guess you're getting the price because he missed the cut of the Masters. He missed the cut of the Wells Fargo last time out. But it's been a little bit hit and miss this season. Um, top, fives at, top fives at the Honda, at the Arnold Palmer. Uh, eighth at the Texas Open as well. Sixth and eighth at the US PGA this event over the um, last few years, 2018, 2019. And uh, as, as Barry will attest, um, if you ask him, I'm sure he'll regurgitate his uh, story about Gary Woodland um, to... Uh, until it's very dark in the evenings, uh, it's, um, you know, he's, he's a major winner. He can uh, he, he can use that experience to, uh, to to do well again this week. I think 125 to one. I thought oh, there was no reason to to leave him out of my team. So so Woodland and Kokrak to back up my mad Fowler bet with the three that I put up in my preview yesterday for three figure prices. Is there anyone else at that kind of price, Barry? That you like? Did you just take my laminated favorite golfers list and just use it for your bets this week, Paul? I'm, I'm <laughs> curious. Like, <laughs> Follow me in, Barry. Follow me in. The, the, the Gary's been funny because I, we haven't been able to properly catch him, but he hasn't properly mm. caught fire either. So mm. but there's enough going on in the game that has attracted our attention to be like, oh, he should be doing something You were on him at the here. Masters, weren't you? Mm. And then I've been on him since then. I think I was on him in Mexico, and his tee to green game was elite. But at both um, uh, both Augusta and uh, Mexico, his putting was abysmal. If he could sort the putter out, he, he'd be back close to his best. Mm. Tee to green, he's bang on it. Yeah, so, yeah. I, don't, I don't think he's a million miles away. Gary. Yeah, I don't think no, he's a million not. miles away. No, he's not. But yeah, I don't. Yeah, you on Gary this week, and Barry or still pondering. I don't know, Paul. I, like, like, I almost feel like if I don't, I'm going to have extreme FOMO going into Thursday. So I, I might just he like literally like I could back that guy till kingdom come, and I still be in profit on him after the US mm-hmm. Open. So um, yeah. I think I, that at a triple digit price, um, throw a little half a point each way or something, just to just so I'm emotionally not uh, traumatized after seeing <laughs> in the top ten going into like. Sunday yeah. or something like that. So yeah, um, this is uh, yeah. If you're ever gonna get well, I get loose on majors, so um, you just want to you just want to have some interest going into Sunday. So it's it's definitely not a, a smart betting strategy, but it's fun. So and I don't mm-hmm. bet to win money; I bet to have fun. So um, the price on Kokrak is like, I mean, I know his majors record is not amazing, but for somebody who's ranked thirty first in the world. We can question the how accurate the world rankings actually are, but it's quite disrespectful. It doesn't really match up price no. versus ranking. Interesting one. Mm. Who are you going to go for, Barry? We're still we're still kind of moving inwards. Um, <laughs> Have you got anything? Oh, one thing I'll point out to the listeners here, just just for background, eight of the last 10 PGO Championship winners were sub 45 to 1. We have had some outliers, though. Clearly last year, 250 to 1, Phil Mickelson. 
On top of Phil Mickelson, we had uh, Keegan Bradley at 150 to 1. And we had, sorry, 175 to 1. Y.E. Yang, 2,950 to 1. So you actually look at that. 250 is 175 to 1. And then everyone else has been sub 45 to 1. And that kind of placed me in terms of where I was putting my selections this week. For me, I needed players that were kind of 40, 45 to 1 and below. And, you know, that's why I went for Mackenzie Hughes, because I think he's a daft decent each way punt in a in a in a tournament that's likely to be very, very windy and high scoring. So I've gone for three sub thirty to one. Yeah, there's there's one other at the outside prices and his withdrawal. Who are you on? Um Eric Van Royen. And it, the the only concern is the withdrawal last week, but that could have been purely strategic to get down here to practice a bit more. Um Yeah. So yeah, he's you know mid mid one hundreds to one, what one fifty to one ten places um is is interesting and I think I might put him in a DraftKings team as well. Um so he's another one who's got my interest. But yeah, other than that, I'm kind of where I was with my core bets from we placed last week. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm 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 moving in. I, I mean Max Homer's price was nuts on the exchange last week. I got him at ninety. He's into 75. Um, mm. I think that's a, 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 that price reflects his lack of amazing performances in the majors. But as we've been following Max all the way along for that, like particularly for the last year and a half, um, mm. he just seems to be adding a piece to the puzzle and building yep. the, the foundations and the building is getting stronger and stronger um, every mm. step he takes. I mean, it, it looks like contending in a major or getting a major is his next step. I mean, maybe a WGC, but he's won a cup. He's won, you know, an elite event. Uh, you could argue it's probably, you know, on a par with the WGC and winning Riviera. Um, just yeah. The, stat, the stature of the event. Um, won at a real grind there a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. And, and, just and a winner to- at Quail Hollow, a PGA yeah. Championship venue. Yeah. So you know just, he can play major golf courses. It's just the, yeah. I think it's just the mental thing with him. It's it's this layering, isn't it? He yes. feels a bit he feels a bit Jimmy Walker to me when Walker won this a few years ago. You know, Jimmy he had had a few couple of top tens before he won in majors, but Walker was one of those at a bigger price. You thought well, he hasn't really, can he cut it in a major and then bang wins a major from first round through to final round. Yeah, Home, you, get, you get that kind of feeling. It's just been a slower development, but he's got all of the game to actually contend in these kind of tournaments. It just wouldn't shock any of us if he got there. Now, no. his his general price has been... He's in around that 50, 45s, 50s. I was hoping for a little bit more. I might have a look around and see, can I get something like 60s? But I've got the win only on the exchange, so you know, just kind of blend that in with an each way somewhere with some places just to catch him if he doesn't win. So he would be my next one in. And then beyond that, I'm, I'm tighter into the, the, the shorter prices. So uh, Barry, Barry Max is 80 to one with 10 bet. 80 to one. I might, I I might do a full poll on it and go price proud. (laughs) I'm taking the full price. Well, you've, you've, you've kind of put your stall out there with the the win only option as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Different ways. So I don't play. mind I don't mind taking the shorter price on the each way to get some places to kind of try cover that off as a mm. Yep. Uh, listen, I, I my gambling strategy should not be followed. It is not it is not proven. It is you know, <laughs> it's not mathematical. It's um it's a bit loose and what feels right and you know it's, it's just for fun. That's, so that's, that's what we like about it. Anyone else in this kind of mid range? Paul, are you no, not for on me, anyone no. in this section? No, I've got a couple near nearer the top and that's it. Right, okay. Well I'll lead off because I I I'm pretty certain that one of you is following me in on on the first one I'm going to talk about. I don't think that um Augusta national form is a bad look here. Um I also don't think that total driving will be a bad look here and one thing that Hideki Matsuama has definitely sorted out in recent times is his total driving so pretty long pretty straight 
I think he's actually taken. I think he made a decision a while ago to to stop lashing at the driver, take a few yards off it, and concentrate on hitting for more fairways. He's eleventh for total driving right now. He's forty fourth for distance, seventy eighth for accuracy, and that's the kind of number I want to see around here. I don't. People are saying it's a bombers golf course. I think it's. You could say that, but I think more it's a total driving golf course. It's a golf course where if you're longer and straighter, you're going to have some real advantage. So I'm just going through the total driving rank right now. Rahm at one, Victor Hovland, no short game at two. Xander at four. Xander's a definite. If Xander can work it out mentally, he's a proper, proper threat this week. Morikawa was at five. The trouble with Morikawa is it's more accuracy than distance, which is something I don't like at the PGA. Lou is tied with him at five. Then you've got Davis Riley. I've said he's a prestigious driver. Jason Kokrag at eight. Sung Jaim, who I know you were particularly sweet on Barry's at nine, but clearly he's not playing. Then we go out to the likes of Matt Suama at 11, who is tied with Cam Young. Now, Cam Young is far more distance than accuracy, as is Rory McIlroy. So I'm on Hideki, a PA Masters victor. Second and seventh for strokes gained T to green at Augusta National 2020-2021. I was really impressed with the way that he was T2 going into the weekend at the Masters when defending this year. And that was with all of these problems with the neck. He's gone away. Neck seems perfect. Came back completely off the radar last week. Fires in a Sunday 10 under 62. Just to see... It was one. Of, I think it's one of those. Let's see what's really under the bonnet today, Hideki, and it's ten under sixty-two. And his numbers were just the kind of numbers you want to see going into a PGA Championship. Long off the tee, excellent total total driving, excellent ball striking, top ten for GIR. His strokes gain numbers were just as great. First for strokes gained approach, third for tee to green. So yeah, Hideki for me. I think we know for a fact, I've, I've put this in the uh, preview, seven of his eight PGA Tour victories have come on greens with bent as a kin key constituent of them. Four pure bent grass, two on velvet bent grass overseed at Scottsdale and also a victory on bent mixed with power at Firestone South. Seven of eight. So, yeah, I think it's a great golf course for him. Hideki Matsuama. Mm-hmm. I'm in. I got 30 to 1 yesterday with bet 3658 places each way. I'm looking now. Best price I'm seeing is 25 to 1. Yeah. Oh, he's 28 to 1 with 10 bet. He's been popular, and quite rightly so, after the, um, the finish he had last week. So mm. A lot of punters will use that recency bias and, uh, and just lump on, which um, can work. These informed players coming into majors are always ones to uh, to keep a very keen eye on. I'm in on Hideki. I was last yeah. week. I'm I'm st- I'm even possibly a little bit sweeter now, and I was very sweet on him last week. Look, just just like an object, looking at the the odds boards, this is very similar to what we had going into the Masters. You had about twelve guys that were twenty twenty twos to one and shorter. So yep. the bookies kind of don't have a clue who's going to do it. So, and what worked at the Masters was who's who's the hottest golfer who's hitting amazing right now, and Hideki is one of them. Yeah, quite undercooked as well. I th- I think he's coming. You like you said, there's a big twelve here. No one's really putting any emphasis on Hideki Matsuama in the press or the media. I think because he's now a major winner, that huge level of pressure he felt from the Japanese media and sporting public, that's kind of mm. dissipated. He can just go on and play golf now. I'll tell you another fact here. This this is this is really good. Forget about Mickelson. Morikawa, Kepka, Kepka, Thomas, Jimmy Walker. Uh they all had fantastic final rounds in the outing before they came to the PGA and won it. And then you've got Matsuama shooting 60, one back of Xander. Mm. So it does scream Hideki, it does scream Xander. I just, I just looked at the two and I thought, 
I've got a Masters winner here that I can get at 30 to 1, where Xander, who hasn't won a, ma- won, won a major as yet, and we know that he can, and we know that you know he's more than capable, but he hasn't won since 2017 on the PGA Tour. Yes, he's won the Olympics. Yes, he's won a team event. Don't know. I just took the 30. I took the bigger price on Matsuyama. I think they're equally good cases, to be honest, for the two of them. My my sweetest bet of the lot, and it has been for ages. Full disclosure, and we and Paul uh, Barry and I disclosed this on the research podcast. We were both on last week on Jordan Speed. What was the first price we got, Barry? Was it twenty sixes on the exchange? Twenty sixes, then it went to twenty nines. It drifted to twenty nines after the first round at Bayern, and we topped up, didn't we? A twenty nine to one on the exchange, yeah. Yeah. Friday morning. And I've also put a little sprinkle on because he's eighteen to one now. So I'm on an eighteen to one with William Hill on Jordan Spieth. It's it's a pretty obvious case, isn't it? Really, he's playing damn good golf. He's a Texas golf course expert, a bit like Jason Kokrag is on the choir. To me, this is almost if you said to Jordan Spieth, "Hey, um, where would you want a major?" He'd probably say, "Oh, Colonial." I'd love a major at Colonial. If you said, well, you can't actually have it in Texas, I <laughs> wouldn't be surprised if he said, well, you know what? I'd probably have it at Southern Hills because it's a golf course that's 250 miles away from where I live and it's effectively like playing in Texas. It's going to be windy, bent grass greens, and it's a got it's going to be a tournament where approach and short game is going to be absolutely vital. I mean, it just screams Jordan Spieth. <laughs> Ever since I did the research on this golf course, you know, I'm t- talking last month. Jordan Spieth was always near the very top of my shortlist. Yeah, he's just right for it. It's just yeah. whether he can handle the mental side of the Grand Slam. That's all it is. Yeah, it's a factor, isn't it? It's, will, will it play on his it, mind? He's been number know. one. He's been number one. He was number one for tee to green at the Valero Texas Open. I put him up at the Masters, missed the cut. He was then number one for tee to green at the RBC Heritage. He wins the week after. He was number two for tee to green last week at the Byron Nelson, finished second. Oh, yeah. And when yeah. you look at Spieth, all of his major wins have come after hot form and when his tee to green game is at its very peak. All three of his majors, exactly the same. Yep. Oh, yeah. On top of that, off the tee, fourth and seventh, fourth and seventh over those same two starts. Yeah. Um, strokes going approach 10th and 4th. His long game is in a really good spot right now. I'm with you, boys. I'm, I, I didn't get the exchange prices, but I took him at um, 20s with nine places each way with Hills early yesterday. Um, so we're all on Spieth this week. Um, I, 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 it might well come down to the putting because, again, if you look last week, which one did he three-putt? Was it the 10th last week from memory? Um, three putted from six feet or so, and ultimately that cost him cost him victory, didn't it? He was one shot behind um, yeah, yeah. KH Lee. He makes that six footer, then you know everything else remaining equal, he wins that golf tournament. Uh, strokes game putting positive overall last week, though, even despite the um, the odd blip here and there, and you know combine that with the fact that his long game is as good as it has been, well, forever potentially. Yeah, he's, 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 he's got to be a bet this week, Spieth. He's going to be very, very popular. There's going to be a, a lot of tipsters are going to put him up this week. He's going to be backed in um, relentlessly, I think, until the start. So, yeah, I can't see why not. What do you like about Spieth this week, Baron? That he's going to win me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was an evil laugh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the... Just everything. The whole thing just seems to be coming back together. I mean, and, and the the pre shot, you know, whatever he needs to do to get his feel in place doesn't seem as aggressive as it has been a few weeks ago. So that means it's getting he's getting closer and closer to it, feeling really comfortable um, and natural. So look, the, he's moving the ball both ways. He's hitting it great. Um, he is. The kind of, I mean, as we said it last week, I want that kind of Podrick Harrington grindy mindset to like, like being allergic to birdies or that, you know, that vibe about feeling allergic to 
bo- sorry, bogeys. Um, and yeah, just bo- bo- getting the avoidance key this Just week, yeah. getting those pars in. And Speeth is just a devil for being able to do that. Um, anytime I have opposed him and I'm watching him go up against one of my guys and it's one of those needs to save par, needs to save par, and you're like, oh, he's going to make bogey or double here, and he makes par, and you're going, God damn it. So he's, he's think just... about he, it last week, chaps. He finished second in a birdie fest in a putting contest, and he was 23rd for putts per GIR. Yep. This is not going to be in any way, shape, or form a putting contest. And here's one number that I think just displays why Jordan Spieth is the back this week. Total driving, uh, our American, what are you talking about total driving? Well, total driving is not a bad stat, I think. It shows a mix of accuracy and distance. Jordan Speed, 2020, 155th for total driving. A mess. Last year, even more of a mess. 167th for total driving. Right now, in the charts, he's 41st. That's how much he's improved the driver. And from fair way in, there aren't many better on the planet than Jordan Spieth right now. So he's kind of managing. In fact, the driving's becoming a strength, yep. which is really concerning for the opposition. He's he's banging it out there as well. Yeah. He's, 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 he's gained some He was yardage. top 12 for DD last week, yeah. Driving yeah. distance. He's getting it out there. Don't you worry about that. Yeah, 13th. He averaged 319 off the tee. That's long enough. That's yeah. long enough. I, That's long enough to win the PGA. I don't think that this golf course is going to play as long as that seven five. They're going to have some shortened tees. Those two par yeah. fives chew up. Like, like I said, even at the at the full seven five five zero yardage, nearly thirteen hundred yards of that is taken up by the two par fives. So all yeah. of a sudden, you now have a six thousand two hundred and fifty yard par sixty, which we wouldn't bat an eyelid at if you if you think it was a seven seven thousand two hundred fifty yard par seventy. So yeah. you know it, that that kind of tried, it's not a perfect equation, but um, there's only a couple of big big holes there. The rest are all, and so I don't think being an apt like I don't think being short is going to help you this week, but. I don't think being a bomber is a prerequisite to success here. Um, it'll help, but yeah, I, I think if you can hit a two ninety five, and you, you know the rest of your game, yeah, you're fine. So, but listen, the extra few yards going to help, uh, or can only help. As long if as I was to offer, if I was to offer you, if I was to offer you two boys, one of three at the top of the betting, John Rahm. Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy. And I said, I'll give you a tenner to back them. Which one would you take? Paul first. Who would you take? Ram, Scheffler, McIlroy. Um, I think it'd have to be Scheffler. I ca- <sighs> Given he, how, how he's turned into a serious winning machine over the last few months... You know, catapulted himself straight up to world number one. Uh, he's been out to Southern Hills. He's played the course. He shot sixty four, as we talked about in the uh, research pod the other day. Um, describes it as one of his favourite courses. Uh, there's an awful lot to like, isn't there? Um, it doesn't always work like that. You know, there's there's a, a, an elite field there trying to chase him down, but. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess if you just flip that on his head, and which player would I play as a pivot in my, um, uh, or, or as, as kind of a mainstay in my um, DraftKings teams this week, then it's likely to be Scheffler over the other two. Barry, Ram, Scheffler, McElroy. Uh, I'd probably like I'd probably take Scheff- Scheffler. I think he's the slightly hotter player. I, I would go Scheffler, Rory, Ram. Yeah, so Rams. would I, actually. Ram would be the third for me. I just don't like Ram. I, personally or in a Not personally. I just, I, just, I just think he's overrated in majors. Yes, he's won one, but um, that was on his favourite golf course, coming off a, a virtual 54-hole, six-shot lead at Muirfield. I've, I've, I've actually backed Scheffler. The last two PGA here, PGA Championships here, Nick Price and Tiger Woods were both world number ones when they won. 
And I read this piece on Golf Digest and, it, and the, the, there was a local guy talking about the course and he said, this is the kind of golf course that will weed out the very best players, bring them to the top of the leaderboard and the last two PGAs here, the current world number one. Interesting with Nick Price, he'd only just become world number one. He'd won two tournaments. He then came in, one, I think he was third in Southwind and then he won this. This was his first, third major victory of his career. And I, and, and I looked at it. You've seen Woods, you've seen Harrington, you've seen McElroy, and you've seen Spieth all win um, back-to-back majors. So I would not be surprised if we throw lots of mud at the wall and none of it sticks and Scotty Scheffler just wins another because <laughs> he's having such a great year. Yeah. It will be very annoying for the slightly longer odds players we've backed yeah. if he does that. And that's kind of why I went for him at twelve to one because it's kind of I can't see in a I can't see a world where Scheffler isn't on the first page of the leaderboard coming to the close of this tournament. So it's just nice to have him on board on that basis. That feels very valid. Yeah, kind of insurance bet. So my final four were Scheffler, Spieth, Matsuama, and Mackenzie Hughes. I think we've you've got another one, haven't you, Barry? Before we close, yeah. You're going to be so annoyed. You should have gone for five players, Steve. You should have figured this out. Hmm. I'm, I've already save, gone quiet. Sand save percentage. Here, come, here comes the trend, Barry. Here comes the trend buster. <laughs> here you go. The trend, the, listen, the year of the trend busting. Oh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Sand save no, percentage. No, I would second. not be surprised in any way, Se- shape or form. 70.27. Scrambling, second, 71.52. Stroke gained, uh, sorry, proximity, number one in proximity on tour. Where is he in strokes gained approach? Fourth in strokes gained approach. We know he hits it long enough. He's flighting the ball right to left, left to right. He had such a near miss, uh, what, a couple of months ago when Straka pipped him. He got really unlucky with the weather conditions kicking in. He's a major champion. It seems as happy as he's possibly ever been. Um, and he's Irish as well. So that's like a little kind of booster for me. <laughs> the only thing that annoys you about him and why you didn't back him is because he hasn't played in, what, three weeks? Is that it? Four yeah, weeks now? That's the three only weeks. reason, Bear. But his run of form is second, 13th, 12th, 35th, third, third, 13th in a team event. And he's just taken a break to recharge the batteries uh, to come out and go win in the golf course, which should suit him quite nicely. Mm. Bit of wind, slightly technical, I guess. Uh, yeah. I just don't see why Lowry can't, um, can't do it this week. No. And he's got, a de- he's got he's got a decent U.S. Open and PGA Championship history behind him. Mm. Yeah, he, 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 he he's 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 just fine. Yeah, and just three fine of the last kind of three of the last four years in the PGA, he's got fourth and eighth and a twelfth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. So it, don't 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 think he's a coastal horse for the course. He 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 can play these classical long parkland golf courses in America just fine. Yeah. Especially when you see this wind forecast. Yeah. No, there's lots of yeah. light. Shane's the other one I've backed as well. So it sounds like we're all quite aligned here. So I've backed Spieth yeah. and Lowry at the, uh, the, the kind of towards the top end. But I might just have to have a saver, you know. <laughs> this is boomer bust, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Because we're all aligned. This is this well, is going to be like we're all going on holidays to Aruba to get on the winnings this <laughs> week. <Aruba. laughs> I might just have to. I might have to have a spare. Go through the back of the cupboard and put another few quid on Shane. <laughs> I mean, we were all on him at the Masters, and um, he didn't play badly at all, did he? I, you know, no, he's great. In the end, he wasn't close enough to to Sheffield. Well, this, to yeah, and you've hit the nail on the head, Paul. This course will suit him better than Augusta because Augusta, as we know, plays closer to seven, eight, seven, nine. This doesn't. Mm. Yep. Yeah, it's it's right in his wheelhouse, mate. I'm backpedalling, big, big star. <laughs> I'm worried because you two are on him and I'm not. That concerns me greatly. Mm. Mm. I might it's okay, have Steve. Don't exchange bet cover. I think. 
Don't feel bad about it. The amount of bets I place because of listening to what you guys come up with on the podcast. Like having, having, a, having a web browser in front of me is a very dangerous thing when we're recording. Uh, it's your trigger finger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's us then, chaps, isn't it? Yep. I we've, think we've had a good old chat about the PG. I'm looking forward to it. I yeah, know. It, I know it's. Uh, I know it's one of the. It's probably the smallest of the four majors, but I think it, there's been some absolutely classic PGAs over the years, and this this could be another one. Mm. Great golf course, great weather. It's going to really see, separate the wheat from the chaff. I think it's going to be cracking. Yeah, and you've got the you know the best part of all of the world's top hundred there. Give what you know the the odd omission. Mm. Um, it's going to be a pretty. Good spectacle, I, I should imagine. Brilliant. Well, thank you for your time this morning, gentlemen. I hope your bets go well. If you yeah, best luck, guys. Uncle. You too, boys. I hope your but bets go well at home. And we will be back next week for... Oh, oh, what's your event? It's the Dutch Open next week. With all the stats and the tips and so much more. Cause it's the Dutch golf Open bed on it's the... PJ Tour, we've got the chance of the challenge. Good week for golfing. I hope your bets go well, chaps. We'll see you again next week. Goodbye.